And I'm afraid I'm going to be showing my age because a lot of this is drawn from Morrowind and not Skyrim. So. <laughs> Um, but uh, anyway, I was actually uh, at the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities in 2014. So that's here in Edinburgh for nine months. And some of these thoughts did come to me whilst I was playing Morrowind. Um, so uh, yeah, it's uh, great to, uh, that the organisers have given me this opportunity to share those thoughts with, uh, with you all today. Right. Okay, is this going to do what I want to do? Okay, so generally speaking, archaeometallurgists are quite a practical bunch. Uh, lots of them come from very scientific backgrounds. Sometimes that's just archaeoscience, and sometimes that's literally they've gone through, done undergraduate masters, PhDs with chemistry, with physics, and, and that type of thing. And that's absolutely brilliant if you want to deal with micrographs and phase diagrams and all these very complicated things. And it means that they have a great interest in like how things are done as well. How did it actually operate in the past? The problem is, is that it doesn't get very imaginative when it gets out into the wider context of what it really was like to be a metallurgist in the past. Um, so whenever somebody has done a kind of ethnographic study suggesting, oh yeah, these people tend to think about it in tune with fertility of the land or you know that type of thing, suddenly the whole of prehistoric Europe, it's all about fertility of the land and that's all iron working was about. So yeah, that can be somewhat of a problem. There's a lot of discussion about uh, metallurgy as being this very specialist type of knowledge that hardly anybody knew, very, very secretive and, and that kind of thing. And that is a trope that appears again in every single society. Now, the one thing that they are really good at in terms of like being with being imaginative, um, is the actual physical process of how to smell, how to mine. And that's because any chance to go out there and do some experimental archaeology, yeah, we're all piling in. So that's great. And that means that we have that kind of like, you know, one-to-one uh, -one direct experience of what it's like to carry out the process. However, the bit that's difficult is trying to put yourself in the position of somebody carrying out this process without really knowing what's going on because that's exactly what was going in, on in the past. And that means that all of these processes were to some extent magical or mythical or you know, ritualized. And trying to put people's back into that position is incredibly difficult. So this is where Tamriel and other places can kind of help um, come in, because here we have very imaginative worlds um, where you have practical elements, um, but you also have magic and you have the supernatural being intertwined with those. And one of the things that's quite interesting from my point of view, as somebody who's obsessed about metals all the time, is that metal artifacts tend to be really quite overrepresented when it comes to mythical uh, objects. You think about swords, you think about rings, uh, any other type of jewellery, crowns, those type of things, they tend to have metals in there. But also, another thing that's very interesting, and this was my thought from 2015, is the fact that metals themselves can be mythical. We have things like mithril, for example, and adamantium. And these are metals which have never actually existed, but people were thinking about you know, unreal metals uh, for certain mythical um, reasons. So today, what I want to try and go through very, very quickly, and I've realized I've done my usual thing, which is trying to cram too many things into too short a time. But I want to talk about how the um, process of metallurgy is treated in most game worlds. Um, I want to talk about um, this kind of ranking of materials that happens and how they integrate the mythical and um, mystical elements into a kind of practical Practical hierarchy and also I want to talk about enchantments. So this is kind of like an overview of how um, games tend to focus on um, archaeomet on metallurgy in general. So they pick out three specific stages that are of importance. So mining, so that's uh, obtaining the actual rock ore in the first place that contains our metal. Smelting, that's how we get the metal out of the rock using heat. And then shaping, and I'm using shaping in a very, very generic way because it seems like that all you have to do is literally have some metal and then something happens and then you've got your object. Um, and that seems to be you know, the way that these things are, are, are done. So what's very interesting is that this process is then applied to every single metal, whereas in the real world, that's not actually quite how it works. So for instance, you'll be told to go and uh, mine out some gold ore 
Um, and that's not really something that's very possible because gold is just gold. It generally is not found as ore unless you have very, very specific circumstances. And so the idea that you would take an ore and smelt it to get gold is not something that actually happens. But you can see that there's this idea that all metals can be treated the same in the game world. Also, the quality of the raw material that you get out is always the same. You don't get out a good iron or a bad iron in, in Minecraft. You also always get an iron bar and it's interchangeable. And it doesn't matter which rock you used or whether you went to deep slate or anything else, it's all exactly the same. Um, but the other thing that really um, strikes me is the fact that there is hardly any attention paid to the actual making of the objects. So we've got two stages which are given over to obtaining the metal, but the actual making of objects is like treated as like, oh yeah, and then this is a fairly easy bit that you just do um, at the end. And in fact, actually, um, and this also varies by metal, um, the amount of work that you have to put in into making the object is usually the bit that actually takes up the most time. And for some Think like um, producing iron, the skill of the person who has to take this um, raw form of iron out of the furnace, an iron bloom, and then basically hit it <laughs> a lot until you eventually get it to uh, be a workable metal. And this is hours and hours of investment of time and whew, completely just not there in any of the game worlds. Now, some of the games have tried to integrate skill, and this is where I can go into Skyrim uh, here. So on Skyrim, you do have this ability to um, use your skill as a uh, crafter in order to produce better artifacts and also to improve those artifacts. And that's great. But what's happened in Tamriel in a response to the kind of addition of this crafting system, which never used to exist, is they've had to change their entire approach to metals. And in some way, they've actually redefined metalworking skill within their own game world. So previously, if you were playing Morrowind and you got some orcish armor, you would know that this orcish armor was actually made out of steel. And it was made out of steel that was produced to a very high quality uh, and very high quality artifacts because the orcs happened to have this amazing ability to work metals. However, once you get into Skyrim, you suddenly have something very different going on. Instead, that skill is coming from the ability to work metals that other uh, people are unable to work. And that goes for all the elvish armors as well. Um, and uh, so you can see here on my you know, big piece of research that I did for this particular <laughs> presentation, um, that if you uh, start off with the very first game, so this is Arena and it's kind of like works from left to right and down and along, that when you start off with these very early games, all of the metals they're using, they are real metals or they are previously known mythical metals, so ones that everybody's heard about before, or it's the use of a metal which is kind of acceptable in myth, so silver for killing monsters is something that's a standard trope. And then as you go through, you suddenly get more and more metals which are invented, or they have to be used for uh, in a way which actually they cannot be used um, in real life. And so uh, another good example of this is steel. So in real life, steel is a alloy of iron and carbon, and you produce it over time very carefully by uh, doing the same process of carburization, and you acquire very high-skilled blacksmith in order to be able to produce the very best steels. Well, on Skyrim, you just go and get uh, another ore called corundum, and you mine that out, and then you put the two together, and hey presto, you have steel. What's very strange is that in real life, corundum does exist, but it's the non-precious variety of sapphire and ruby. So they've taken a word which applies vaguely to the world of crafting and they've reused it. And this indeed goes for quite a few of these other ones as well. And we can see this in the way that they have decided to redefine glass. So in Morrowind, glass was like ebony. It's supposed to be a bit like obsidian, but it's the light armor version and the ebony is the heavy armor version. And then as you go into uh, Skyrim, glass suddenly becomes basically a metal and you smelt it from Malachite. Malachite in real life being a copper ore. So you can see how they're kind of like twisting this terminology around. 
So uh, moving on to the next point um, about metal itself being m mythical or magical, as I've mentioned, there are these metals like mithril, like adamantium, and what they are able to produce are artifacts which have the perfect properties. So generally speaking, these are used for things like weapons or for armor, um, and they are able to be shiny and bright. They are nice and lightweight if you're going to use them for armor. They happen to be very strong. Whereas is in real life, you have to balance these things out. So one of the most important balances that have to be found is between um, hardness uh, and brittleness. So if you make something too hard in metal, it becomes very brittle and uh, vice versa. So you need to find, strike these balances. The great thing about mythical metals is you don't need to because they basically have these properties that go beyond what is capable in the real world. So this kind of like brings in the supernatural, brings in the um, perhaps also elements of the divine into the, uh, into the world of metalworking. And we do have these kind of practical elements to real world metalworking, which may have in the past have seen quite magical. And one of these is simply better ore sources. So in the real world, ore is not just ore. You can go to a mine and you will get out a, uh, it's usually an ore with a combination of minerals in there, which can give you a better product. So for example, phosphoric iron. Uh, rather than straightforward iron, or indeed, if we go further back in time, arsenical copper, uh, rather than just straightforward copper. And both of those have these additives, which then are able to produce a much better alloy for whatever purpose you want, usually tools and weapons. Um, but it means that uh, it, to the outside, it kind of looks like, oh, well, so if you get it from this place, this one has these magical properties in comparison to another place. And another thing which is uh, also touching on this is the idea of secret or non-secret alloy recipes. So this is drawn from my um, area of expertise, which is the late Bronze Age um, or Aegean. And here, around about the 18th, 17th century BC, we suddenly see the production of a new type of metal. And this metal is known as black copper or black bronze, not a particularly imaginative name for what is quite an amazing um, alloy. Um, but as you can see from this dagger, this is just one example of a range of products that were being made at the time where there was a great emphasis on color. These, um, all, all the lines have got like, you know, different colored manes and things like this. And that's all done by alloying. It's not painted or anything. They have very carefully controlled every single alloy to get exactly the color they want. And they also decided that they wanted the color black. And black does not exist naturally in the metal world. So the only way that you can create this is to put together four different metals, a little in there, Copper and tin gives you your basic bronze. And then you add in your two very precious metals, gold and silver. And you put those together, then you are able to then put this through a pickling process, which creates this black patina on the outside. And it gives you this lovely contrast color, which they're then using to provide background so you can see the colors better. And also like little details like eyes and things like this to really kind of bring all of the characters to life. So this kind of is magical in two ways. One is, is that it gives you a brand new color that just does not exist naturally. So that must have been really quite exciting for them. The second thing is it's self-healing. If you scratch it, the color will regrow over the top again. And this, again, I mean, it must have been seen as pretty amazing at the time. It's not like this is something that you can really get every day in the material world of the Bronze Age. So I'm fairly sure that they thought that this was a particularly fascinating metal. And in fact, a colleague of mine, um, Alessandro Guama Mer, has suggested that we see the production of this metal in this particular passage from the Iliad. So um, Achilles requires a new shield. And so he goes to his mom, as you always do when you need a new shield. And so, and so she goes to Hephaestus, the god of smithing, um, and he produces a Achilles-worthy shield. And this Achilles-worthy shield is made out of copper and tin with gold and silver. And then he produces this shield. And then there's this interesting thing where he says, it's set around with a bright rim, as though the interior is not bright. And then when they talk about the kind of decoration that they have on it, it includes things like the stars and other celestial bodies. Well, they look better against the dark. So perhaps what we are seeing here is this kind of dark 
um, background being produced by using these metals and then it is being decorated with an appropriate, um, appropriate element. So another thing which happens quite a lot in uh, these games is the repurposing of metals. So most games have some kind of leveled um, artifacts. I'm sure you recognize these various different types. And the idea is, is that you use material as a convenient shorthand to say this one is better than the other, rather than having to sit there and read manuals or long uh, list of stats or anything. That does mean that occasionally you have objects which are being produced in very inconvenient uh, materials that don't make any sense whatsoever. So uh, gold axes um, being a most uh, obvious example. Um, except for actually, we do get gold axes in the past, and perhaps this is something that we need to be thinking about. Now my previous research was on metal vessels and I was able to show that they did clearly have a hierarchy of metals and they were treating gold as the most precious of the metals in that industry uh, and uh, bronze and lead as lesser metals. And we have these um, ordinary axes you can see at the bottom like the one I've listed as functional double axe. You can take that, stick it on the appropriate handle and chop down the tree with it. They also have a large number of axes which are being produced, which are in bronze, but they're absolutely useless for chopping down trees. They look very axe-like, but they're not actually very functional. And the same being produced in gold and silver. So this is usually seen as, okay, it's taken as a religious symbol, and here we have something which is kind of um, symbolic, votive. Okay, and that's about as far as people take it. If they're talking about the fact that they're in gold and silver, it's, oh, it's display of wealth, oh, it's that kind of like very boring, very, very boring interpretation that keeps on appearing over and over again. What if we have here the production of objects in materials which are suitable for use by other beings? Beings who are not just, you know, earthbound, but we're talking about the divine here. We're talking about deities here. These are being um, put to rest in ritual places. So they clearly are there to have some kind of communication with religious elements. And perhaps that's a bit more than just votives or showing off, oh, well, I put down five gold axes last week. How many did you put down? Type attitude. So, okay, that was kind of like my food for thought on that one. My final point, <clears throat> you'll be glad to hear, and my voice will be glad to hear as well, um, is talking about the self as uh, audience. So this is something which I actually put into print now 10 years ago, and I hate saying things like 10 years ago because that doesn't seem possible. But anyway, um, I put this into print 10 years ago, and what has been interesting to me is that still I haven't really seen anybody else talk about it. So I thought, oh, well, okay, I'll just talk about it again and see what happens. <laughs> and this is basically pointing out that every time we talk about um, the body and we talk about personal adornment, we always talk about it in terms of an external audience. Sometimes that external audience is your peers. Sometimes that external audience is the plebs as you're walking through, you know, Skyrim and people go, oh, yes, you look like you're skilled in alchemy and, you know, whatever it is that they actually say. Um, that's kind of the way that uh, it generally is treated in the archaeological literature. However, I'm sure you'll notice that I have come today in my business wood elf uh, suit um, <laughs> with my um, necklace of uh, loquacity, uh, which has given me plus five to speechcraft, I hope. Um, and we are dressing according to our circumstances. We try to make sure that we ourselves look the part. And this is not just simply because it's fun to dress up, okay, it is, but it's also because it makes us feel much more comfortable in certain situations. And feeling comfortable in our circumstances gives us self-confidence. Self-confidence is relayed to people in all those kind of invisible gestures that people never think about. So all the body language, the tone of voice, everybody picks up on these, but they don't know because it's happening at a subconscious level. And so we are able to transform ourselves into much more charismatic speakers or able to give like an oral authority. I sound like somebody who knows what they're talking about on Morrowind and Stardew Valley for the last 10 minutes, hopefully. And this is something which, um, again, is very important to the way that, say, for example, elite uh, individuals would have been able to project themselves in the past. Now, I thought here that the Master Cover as well is particularly interesting because if you read the accompanying book in Morrowind, it says... This person makes this deal with Clever Casval to get his mask. The mask did not change her looks, but suddenly she had the respect and admiration of everybody. So it's not that she visibly looks different, but somehow the mask has given her the ability to act different. And it also reminded me of the film, which was a great film. I haven't seen that for ages. 
Um, so as well as that, there are other elements of getting ready for whatever grand uh, event is going to happen. Now, again, in the Bronze Age Aegean, we have this wonderful iconography that shows, for example, these ladies clearly all dressed up for most important events to go on. They've got on lavish amounts of jewellery, bracelets, necklaces, their hair's all done. This is the type of thing that takes a lot of time. It's not some kind of like instant thing. And so you end up having to have not just time spent perhaps thinking about how you want to look and preparing yourself but also when you're at this level of society you probably have other people doing this for you as well and so you are attracting attention you're being given attention as part of this preparation and this is also bound to have some kind of rit ritualistic aspects to it so for example being anointed with oil I'm sure that we will be seeing a heck of a lot of this next year for the coronation where you're going to see a lot of ritualistic preparatory stages being done in front of everybody so that they can see that you know know, okay, this person is fit to be king. Um, and then, <laughs> but also, in terms of embodying um, the roles, just a couple more points. One is that we have, in most games, particularly one of my favourite, which is Dungeon Siege 1, shout out for anybody who remembers that one, um, but um, yeah, we have this um, idea that your character has to develop before they can actually wear certain things. So you need to be dexterity 20 before you're allowed to wear that hat. Um, and it does mean that over time your character looks better they just look more cool um, and that, that's absolutely great but actually we do have this in real life it's called sumptuary laws and uh, it means that even people who are wealthy may be denied the ability to uh, wear certain things not because they can't afford them but because they're not allowed to um, and this is something that we need to consider in terms of like this self as audience that if you're one of these people that's allowed to wear this then that's obviously giving you um, a bigger confidence boost than people that aren't. And finally, we do wear things, lucky socks, pretty necklaces and whatnot, in order to be able to draw upon all of their plus three to confidence, plus two to uh, appearance, plus 10 to personality. We do this all the time, again, without thinking. Um, and I think that you know, we, we can do, we can learn a lot about how people were using material culture in the past if we are uh, adding these kind of thoughts um, into our uh, interpretations. So if you've been listening, thank you very much. Um, and uh, these are all the people that I ought to uh, acknowledge for giving me money, for putting up with me, for providing me with some photographs to uh, illustrate today's presentation. Thank you.